أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى this evening we will continue in our series of lessons in the book uh, Shama'il uh, by Al-Imam Abu Isa Al-Tirmidhi Rahimullah uh, this evening we've reached to chapter number 17 uh, where uh, Al-Imam Tirmidhi Rahimullah he says Bab Maja fi imamati Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam The chapter uh, what has been reported in reference to the imama or the turban of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, <coughs> the imama or the turban is that piece of clothing uh, that is worn on the head and uh, it wraps around the head uh, to the point where it covers the head and so some of the ulama have said this is the reason why uh, it's called an imama because it ta'ummur ras because it, it covers uh, the head. Now, uh, the imama uh, with an ayn, imamah, imamah. The imama uh, was worn by the Arabs during the time of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in general. Meaning, before the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was the Messenger, uh, his people, the the Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula. They used to wear the imama. <coughs> Even after the Prophet ﷺ received revelation, the kuffar, you had the kuffar amongst the Arabs who were wearing the imama. And the Prophet ﷺ, the imama is the turban that is worn. It's, it's, it's a piece that you take, it's like a piece of cloth. It's long. You take it and then you wrap and you wrap it around your head, yeah, right? This is called the turban. Um, our brothers in Sudan uh, usually wear them. Uh, some of the brothers in Pakistan, uh, they wear uh, the turbans. Also in Bangladesh, they wear the turban. Uh, <coughs> this, is what we're, we're, this is what we're discussing right now, Shay. Okay. Uh, uh, as I was saying, the Arabs used to wear the, the imama. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, the ulama have mentioned that the wearing of the imama, and I want us to pay attention to what I'm about to say, the wearing of the imama in of itself was not or is not sunnah. The wearing of the imama in of itself is not sunnah. Because we have no ayah of the Qur'an or any hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanding us or encouraging us or anything that shows that there's any virtue in wearing the imama. Other than the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore it. And as we said, that this was something that was from the libas, was from the clothing of his people. In the same way where we talked about wearing sandals. Wearing sandals is not sunnah. No one's going to say that if you wear sandals, then wearing sandals is a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, with that being said, with that being said, if a person is going to wear an imama, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to wear an imama, then there is a reward in following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Does everybody understand the difference? Yes. So, if you say, is wearing an imama sunnah? No. no. But if a person wears an imama, why? Because he wants to emulate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then there is reward 
not in the imamah, but his intention of trying to emulate the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's rewarded. And that is praiseworthy. And we have many evidences <coughs> from the Qur'an and the Sunnah showing that we should emulate and follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the way that he lived, in the way that he worshipped, and in everything about him. And so the, as much as you can follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you should do so. Even if it's in your headgear or your footwear. Because if you have to wear shoes, if you, everybody has to wear shoes, then you have a choice. It's permissible to wear the sneakers. It's permissible to wear boots. It's permissible to wear, uh, uh, we call them hard bottoms. It's permissible to wear all of that. But you have a choice. Now if you choose the sandals of the Prophet wasallam, because this is what the Prophet wore, alayhi salatu wasalam, then the reward in that is emulating the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not, not the shoes in of themselves or the imama in of itself. <coughs> and I hope, uh, I hope that that is clear inshallah ta'ala. And, and, and one of the benefits of that difference is if someone comes and sees that you've never worn an imama, right? He says, I'm, I've been with you uh, Abu Tariq, I've been with you for one year. And in that entire year, I've never seen you wore an imama once. And then he tells you, you, should, you, you need to wear the imama, you're leaving off a sunnah. You say, la, akhi, we're not leaving off a sunnah. Right? I'm not leaving off a sunnah. Why? Because the imama in of itself is not a sunnah. So we cannot go and, uh, and, and, and disparage someone and speak about someone that they've left off something from the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam like if a person left off salatul witr if we found a person who wasn't praying salatul witr then we would say to them akhi you know it would be better for you that you don't leave off salatul witr because this is from what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has legislated for us and we've been commanded by allah azza wa jalla to follow him in that you say akhi you should fast uh, three days out of the month. This is what the Prophet ﷺ has encouraged us to do. And so, <coughs> but if we do not find any command from Allah and His Messenger ﷺ, nor do we find some type of encouragement or some type of virtue, and this thing was from the culture of the people at that time, then we have to say that this was something that is mubah, is something that in of itself is permissible, uh, and that means that, or necessitates, that in of itself there's no reward uh, in that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And I hope inshallah ta'ala didn't confuse uh, anyone. Uh, if anybody's still confused, then we can talk inshallah ta'ala after, uh, after the class. And so, uh, <coughs> the imamah, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has certain descriptions and Al-Imam At-Tirmidhi Rahimullah is going to bring some of what has been described as the of the Imamah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and some of the different circumstances uh, which he was witnessed wearing it. And so the first hadith, Al-Imam At-Tirmidhi Rahimullah, he says we were told by Muhammad Ibn Bashar uh, and his nickname is Bendar. And sometimes you'll see, you'll hear that uh, instead of uh, someone mentioning Muhammad ibn Bashar, they'll mention his nickname, which is Bendar, uh, who said, We were told by Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, who said, On the authority of Hamad ibn Salama. Now, Imam al Tirmidhi, rahimullah, has another chain of narration where he says, We also were told by Mahmud ibn Ghailan, who said, We were told by Waqi'ah. On the authority of Hamad ibn Salama, on the authority of Abi Zubair, on the authority of Jabir, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who said, دَخَلَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ مَكَّةَ يَوْمَ الْفَتْحِ وَعَلَيْهِ عِمَامَةٌ سَوْدَاءٌ <coughs> Jabir ibn Abdullah, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم entered into Mecca on the day of Al-Fatih and he was wearing a black 
Imama. He was wearing a black turban. Now, in our previous class last week, we read a hadith that said that the Prophet ﷺ entered into Mecca while he was wearing what on his head? He was wearing a mirfar, he was wearing a helmet. He was wearing a helmet. <coughs> and so someone may ask, that other hadith said he was wearing a helmet. This hadith says that he was wearing an imamah. How do we join the two? We say there's no contradiction between the two hadith. Because first, first of all, it's possible that the Prophet wasallam, when he entered into Mecca, he was wearing a mirfar, he was wearing a helmet that covered his head, and he was wearing an imamah over top of it. That's possible. It's also possible that the Prophet wasallam, he entered into Mecca at one point he had on the mirfar, and then when he seen, when everything, there was no fighting, everyone had surrendered, the people had accepted Islam, there's no need for the armor, so he took off, may have taken off the, the helmet, and then replaced it with a black imam. Both of those are possibilities. And the other, and the, each sahabi is narrating what he saw. So, <coughs> so the Prophet wasallam is entering into Mecca at one point, and some of the Sahaba saw him while he's wearing the mirfar, while he's wearing the, the helmet. And then later they went off and they did something or they were told to do something or they had responsibilities. And then later the Prophet wasallam, as he was still going, he replaced his headgear and others from the Sahaba saw something different. And so every Sahabi was narrating that which they saw. And so there's no contradiction uh, between the two. So the point here is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered <coughs> into Mecca uh, in the day of Al-Fatih and he was wearing a black imam. The next hadith, uh, an imam al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah, he says, we were told by Ibn Abi Umar, who said that we were told by Sufyan, on the authority of Musawir al-Warraq, on the authority of Ja'far ibn Amr ibn Huraith, on the authority of his father, who's Amr ibn Huraith, who said, رَأَيْتُ النَّبِيَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَخْطُبُ عَلَى الْمِنْبَرْ وَعَلَيْهِ عِمَامَةٌ سَوْدَاءٌ uh, So Amr ibn Huraith, رضي الله تعالى عنه, he said, I saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم delivering a khutbah on the minbar while he was wearing a black imama, while he was wearing a black turban. And so here we have an instance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wearing, uh, wearing the imamah while he's riding in uh, into Mecca. Uh, and we have a second instance where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on the minbar delivering the khutbah and he was wearing the black imamah. The next hadith, Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi Rahimahullah, he says, we were told by Mahmud ibn Ghailan, along with Yusuf ibn Isa. They both said that we were told by Waqi' on the authority of Musawil al-Warraq, on the authority of Ja'far ibn Amr ibn Huraith, on the authority of his father, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave a khutbah to the people and he was wearing a black imama. This is just the same hadith uh, as the previous hadith, whereas al-Imam al-Tirmidhi rahimullah has a different chain uh, of narration. And so he's showing you uh, that I have one chain of narration for this hadith. I also have another chain of narration for the same hadith. And sometimes the scholars of hadith will, will, will mention several, if you're reading the book, it's as if when you read the, the text of the hadith, it's as if it's the same exact hadith being repeated uh, over and over and over again. <coughs> um, however, uh, they're repeating the hadith with different chains of narration. Like for example, Al-Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he will repeat a hadith throughout his book Sahih. But he doesn't repeat the hadith except that there's some type of benefit. Different chains of narration. Uh, this shaykh is narrating from this shaykh and he's trying to prove a particular point 
about the authenticity of the hadith. So for that reason, so as us as the reader, we may read it and think he's just simply repeating the hadith, whereas there are benefits to the repetition. Uh, the next hadith, Al-Imam al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah, he says, we were told by Harun ibn Ishaq al-Hamdani, who said that we were told by Yahya ibn Muhammad al-Madani on the authority of Abdul Aziz ibn Muhammad, on the authority of Ubaidullah ibn Umar, on the authority of Nafi', on the authority of Ibn Umar, radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma, who said, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا اعتم سدل عمامته بين كتفيه. So in this hadith, Ibn Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا اعتم, meaning it was if he wore the imama, then he would, the tail of the imama would dangle between his, uh, his shoulder blades, meaning down the middle, so he would wrap the imama, he wrapped the turban, and then at the end of it, there would be a, a veil, it would be a tail. And the tail will hang out, and it will dangle in between uh, his shoulder blades. And so, uh, Nafi' rahimahullah ta'ala, <coughs> he said, وَكَانَ إِبْنُ عُمَرْ يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ Nafi' said, and, and Ibn Umar used to do that. Ibn Umar used to do that. And what it seems like, this was intentional. It seems as though this was, Ibn Umar was intentionally wearing the imama as the Prophet ﷺ used to wear the imama. Which is why Nafi', uh, which is why Nafi' mentioned that Ibn Umar used to do this. I mean, he used to do this intentionally. He used to do this intentionally, following behind the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, <coughs> and Ubaidullah he said, وَرَأَيْتُ الْقَاسِبِ بِنْ مُحَمَّدْ وَسَالِمًا يَفْعَلَانِ ذَلِكَ And Ubaidullah said, I saw Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad rahimahullah along with Salim rahimahullah uh, also doing that. Uh, does anybody know who Salim is? If you hear Salim, do you know anybody know who that is? He is the son of Abdullah ibn Umar. He is the son of Abdullah ibn Umar. Salim ibn Abdullah. Ibn Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala ta anhumah. So Salim, when Salim's name is mentioned, then mostly if it's just left as that, Salim said this, or Salim did this, then it's referring to the son of Abdullah uh, ibn Umar. <coughs> and so here, <coughs> so if... <coughs> So Ibn Umar, he said, Kana an Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam idha atamma. That the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he used to do this when he wore the imama. Which this, this shows us that this was uh, the characteristic of how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wore the imama. It wasn't just that he saw it happen one time. Like in the previous hadith, the previous hadith of, uh, of, of Amr ibn Huraith, where he said, I saw the Prophet ﷺ on the mimmar doing the khutbah doing this. Meaning that was a one-time incident. Whereas the hadith of Ibn Umar, he said, the Prophet ﷺ, when he wore the imamah, he used to do this. And that gives us the understanding that this was something that he did on a regular basis. This was how he ﷺ used to wear his imamah. And so if we're going to imitate the Prophet ﷺ, and how we're going to, and we're going to, if we're wearing the imama, because the Prophet used to do so, alayhi salatu wasalam, then we should wear it the way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to wear it. <clears throat> now, am I saying that if you wear the imama, it's not permissible to wear it except that it has a tail? La, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that if you're trying to emulate the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, then this is how he wore his imama. This is how he wore the imama with the tail uh, hanging out of the back and dangling between his two shoulder blades. And this was how Ibn Umar used to wear his imama along with Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad along with Salim uh, ibn Abdullah ibn Umar. <coughs> uh, so the next hadith, Al-Imam al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah, he says, we were told by Yusuf ibn Isa, who said that we were told by Waqi'ah, who said that we were told by Abu Sulaiman, 
He's, who is Abdul Rahman ibn al Ghasil, on the authority of Ikrima, on the authority of Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And the Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khatab al nas wa alayhi isabatun dasma. And so here in the hadith hadith, Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam delivered a khutbah and he was wearing an isaba dasma. The isaba dasma bimana al imama al sauda. Is he was his head was wrapped in a black turban. <clears throat> his head was wrapped in a black uh, turban. And so this hadith is in the same meaning of <clears throat> the hadith of Jabir, along with it's the same meaning of the hadith of Amr ibn Huraith. And so we have three hadith: uh, the hadith of Jabir, the hadith of, um, of Amr ibn Huraith, and also the hadith of Ibn Abbas. All three of these hadith showing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore a black uh, turban. He wore a turban. <coughs> wore a black turban. Now, I mentioned previously that uh, the, the sunnah or that the turban is not in of itself a sunnah. And um, I wanted to bring our attention to a hadith that is not authentic. There's a hadith that is not authentic, uh, <clears throat> where it was reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, or someone had said, that he said, Salatun bi imamatin khayrun min khamsin wa ishreena salatun bila imama. That a salat with an imama is more virtuous or is better than 25 salat with no imama. This hadith is mawdur. This hadith has fabricated. Uh, this hadith is fabricated. So it is not, not, it's not that it is just da'if, that is weak, but it is mawdur, it has been fabricated on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there's nothing authentic reported from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, encouraging us to wear the imamah or commanding us to wear the imamah. However, if an individual wishes to do so, uh, emulating the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he will have the reward of the emulation of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With that, inshallah ta'ala will end and then next week we'll pick up uh, chapter 18, which is in reference to the Izar of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, we'll take any questions inshallah. Imama. 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 What, it's not sunnah because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was dressing the way that the people of his time were dressing. Because even the kuffar wore imama. This was a, this was a, a, a culture of the Arabs. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was dressing the, way that he, the same way he was dressing before that he received revelation. And so, <clears throat> and had there been a reward in the imama in of itself, then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have encouraged us or would have commanded us to wear it. He would have encouraged us or he would have commanded us to wear it. And if he did, then it would have been reported and we would have known about it. So since we do not have any reports from the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam telling us that it's virtuous, telling us that we should do it or commanding us to wear it, that means that it's not the sunnah itself. But as I said, if a person is, wears an imamah because he wants to be like the Prophet wasallam, then he will be rewarded for his intention. He'll be rewarded for his intention, not necessarily the, the imamah in of itself. What about the tail? Is it a long tail? The tail, it hangs to between the shoulder blades. Not long? No, not, not long, but it hangs long enough to be between the shoulder blades, but not longer than that. Uh, the same thing. Uh, it's the same thing because we don't, in order for something to be sunnah, we have to have some type of encouragement from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Otherwise, then we, would, then we would say to people, stop eating your cultural foods and start eating the food of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Leave off your food. It's food that you love, like biryani, 
I don't know of any hadith that said the Prophet Ali Salatu Sam ate biryani. You know that hot sauce that you like to put on the food? Gotta stop doing that. Because that's not the sunnah. If, if we were gonna if we we're gonna go down that road, right, we're, we're gonna open up, we're gonna open up a lot of, of different issues. And so uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if it was if it was if it was a good act, because he told us that there's no good except that he commanded us to do it. There's no good except that he commanded us to do it. And so that means that if there's good in it in of itself, then we would have been encouraged by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to do so. If we don't find that encouragement from the Messenger, Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, and he left it, then Al Amru Yabqa ala Aslihi. When we call it Al Bara al Asliya. We, we the, the affair is permissible as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created things everything in the earth for us. <coughs> and so it's permissible for a person to do so if he wishes to wear it. Uh, if he chooses not to, then that's also permissible. No. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. Tawadda. There have been people who tend to say, now that it's not sunnah, we know that. Mm -hmm. So there have been people who, I never wore one, uh -huh. but I know people that do, and they always try to tell people that they have to wrap it right to left, not left to right. So if it's not sooner, then probably no particular way to wrap it, right? Uh, no, there is a particular way to wrap it. We just, we just haven't. Oh. Uh, Tirmidhi, rahimahullah, did not mention every hadith okay. uh, in reference to the issue. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I myself, I used to wear the imamah a long time ago, and then I stopped. It uh, just was a little bit difficult because they, as you know, they come and there's a special type of material that they use to wrap it, um, and then and you know it used to make my head sweaty, and so I, I stopped wearing it. Uh, I wore it for probably about a good year or so. I wore it every day, uh, and then you know it, it started getting a little difficult, and so I, I stopped wearing it. <coughs> so I don't know if if you if it's right to left or left to right. If uh, but there is uh, there is a, you know the the issue of uh, they call it the technique, the, 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 with the strap. Have you, have you ever seen the, the Sudanese brothers, how they wear their imama? Okay, that is uh, closely to what the Arabs were, were wearing during that time. That's how the Arabs were wearing their, uh, their imamas. They wrapped, it was wrapped, had the tail, along with the piece that comes over the, under the neck, because what you can do is you take that piece and you pull it up, and you can cover your face just in case you're out uh, and about in the desert and there's a sudden uh, sandstorm, you get caught out in the sandstorm, you can, you used to, they used to use it so that they, their head was covered, uh, their ears were covered, and they take that piece that wraps under the neck and they pull it up and they cover their mouth and their nose. Yes. Right, that's what that's, that yeah, that's, that's what that's used for. Uh, I, I, I've never seen that. Yeah, Subhanallah. Yeah, yeah. In Guyana, when a guy you get married, your brother get married, you put it on. Ah, Subhanallah. Now, I've never seen the ones that are, that come pre. It's already sewed up like that. You just put it on your head. It's like a hat. Ah, Subhanallah. No, I've never seen that. I don't know how do you how does that work because it has to be, it has to be like you know when you're wrapping it, you're wrapping it tight to the head so that. You know, you can move around and doesn't fall. Like if it's a hat, you know, if you bend over, it falls off. Like if you're praying, if you're making salat. Yes, subhanAllah. <laughs> oh, but can you wear it though? That's the question. Can you wear it? Yeah. Yeah, it's permissible. Okay. There's no problem with it. Um, as long as as long as as long as it doesn't create fitna. As long as it does not create fitna. Um, if you're in a so for example, um, there are certain places that you go where certain types of headwear uh, is is expected. 
um, certain types of headwear that is expected. And so <clears throat> if, you are, if you go to a place where a certain type of headwear is expected and then you're wearing something different, then it, makes, it might make other people feel uncomfortable. Almost, so for example, let's say, we're at a, let's say we get invited to uh, a brother's house, right? American brothers, invite other American brothers to the house for a casual get together. Right? Everybody comes casual. And then someone shows up in a tuxedo. Right? Comes in with a tuxedo. With a hat and a tail. With a cummerbund and a vest. Like a, he, got the whole, he got the whole nine yards. He shows up you know, dressed like this. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it, looks, uh, it looks out of place. And it makes other people feel like, what are you doing? <laughs> But it makes people feel like, you know, like, what's going on here? And, like, and it makes people feel uncomfortable. And so if, if you're wearing something that it's not sunnah in of itself, is going to create fitna and cause problems, then you should stay away from it. You should stay away from that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Now for us in the, in the United States, that may seem a little strange because we're, we're used to people expressing themselves and, and like if for example if you go to South Street uh, in Philly like you go if you take a ride down South Street you're going to see all types of people with all types of like culture it's almost like you're going from like one country to another country because the people are just so different they hang out on on the street and they're just so different from block to block and so we're used to people being different, so it doesn't bother us when we see somebody that kind of looks different. But if you go to other countries, that they're not necessarily used to seeing people who look different. Everybody kind of looks the same. Like when I was in Saudi Arabia, uh, everybody wore the same white thobe. They wore the same red shamal. Some people wore the white one, the white hutra. But most people wore the red shemal. Everybody drove that white Toyota Cresetta, right? Everybody was driving the same car, wearing the same clothes. And this is how their society worked. So if somebody stepped out in a thobe that was like bright, we're not going to say it's not permissible, but like you're going to stand out. Like you look strange in this society. If, if, you, if you came out and you had a yellow, a canary yellow Corvette, you riding around in a canary yellow Corvette, it looks strange. Like everybody's going to be pointing at you. And you're going to make everybody look and point everywhere you go. Because it's strange. Nobody's doing that in this society. And so uh, we don't want to create that type of uh, commotion and bring that type of attention to ourselves. So we have to have an understanding of where we are. And what's acceptable <coughs> culturally in our society. Now, if something is the sunnah, I'm not saying that we need to uh, compromise the sunnah. We never compromise the sunnah. But in reference to that which is permissible, then we have to pay attention to what is culturally accepted in our society. Because we don't want people to blame Islam for our bad manners. Does that make sense? We don't want people to blame Islam because we're, we have bad manners and how we're dressing. It may be permissible Islamically to dress that way, but some people may consider that to be rude. And then they're not just going to blame you. They're going to blame the Muslims. And that's going to affect the sum'ah or the reputation of Islam and the Muslimin. And we don't want to have that type of bad publicity. No. You have something? Oh, okay. So inshallah ta'ala, anybody have anything else? Inshallah we'll, we'll end here and then next week inshallah we'll, we'll pick up with the chapter on the izar of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadha wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyana Muhammad. Khaykum salam wa rahmatullah.